In order to prove the Gödel incompleteness theorems, we need to establish a connection between computability of functions from tuples of natural numbers to natural numbers on the one hand, and definability over the structure of the natural numbers with constants 0, 1, plus, times, and less than. In order to do that, we first need to level the playing field, so to say, because right now the types here are very different. Here we're looking at Turing machines and functions. Here we're actually looking at formulas. So the first thing for us will be to um, code formulas uh, as numbers so we can bring them over into to the realm of uh, the natural numbers. So if you first do this with all the syntactical notions, um, so we represent the syntax via arithmetical operations. Um, and this process is generally called arithmetization or sometimes also Gödelization. Um, we start the whole process by assigning each symbol in our language a code. So we'll be interested in working over the natural numbers with the language of arithmetic, um, but generally this works also for uh, any finite language, mm. uh, as you can easily see from how this is developed here. So here's the symbols of our language, right? So equals, not, and for all, and so on. And um, uh, we also have infinitely many variable symbols. So we just assign, we line up the symbols in this order and assign each of those symbols an odd number. Um, it has certain technical um, advantages to use odd numbers here, as we will see later, but um, there's really various ways, uh, or mer actually myriads of ways to do this, and uh, this is just one example to do it. The whole process is really similar to um, how we defined Gödel numbers of Turing machines, because um, for Turing machines we also had to code first um, the instructions, right, and um, those were uh, finite strings over an alphabet. Uh, now we have uh, formulas, which are and, and terms and formulas and so on, which again are finite strings over our alphabet. So each string now over our language can be assigned a Gödel number, just like we did for Turing machines. Now here we define we uh, uh, kind of a standard way to denote Gödel numbers is by these upper corner brackets here. Um, but the uh, way to define them is just the same. So we use um, the codes for each of the symbols, right? And then we uh, put together the Gödel number using um, the prime powers as we did before. So of course you can do this for any string, in particular for strings that uh, uh, don't even uh, represent just some nonsense. But also for each formula, we get a Gödel number. Um, and as I already said, we can uh, replace the language of arithmetic here easily by any other finite language. And uh, then of course we have to change our uh, symbol encoding scheme that we gave on the, um, on the previous page uh, accordingly. Okay. So next, we need to ensure we can easily recognize and decode the Gödel numbers of basic syntactical objects. This is again similar to um, the idea of decoding Turing machines or Gödel numbers of Turing machines. So the first thing we have to check is that the basic sets uh, or, or concepts of our um, uh, uh, of uh, formal logic are um, result or give us sets of codes that are very easy to recognize. In particular, we want them to be primitive recursive, namely the set of all Gödel numbers for terms, set of all Gödel numbers for formulas, and set of all Gödel numbers for sentences. To show this, um, we have um, various uh, tools now developed to show that um, sets are primitive recursive. Uh, important here is that we can use bounded quantification. Um, so because in particular, any Gödel number, 
for example, um, will have the length of the formula, so length of the formula, phi, right, will be bounded by the girdle number of phi. You can see this easily from the definition of the, a girdle number, right? And once you have this, uh, this gives you, for example, an easy uh, way to bound your formulas. And we know that um, uh, bounded quantification um, does not lead us out of the uh, class of uh, primitive recursive functions. And uh, this will be a great tool to prove things like that. On the, uh, furthermore, we have shown that the coding and decoding all is um, uh, of the numbers. So to get the number and then to get the prime, the exponent of the uh, nth prime in the number back, all these operations are primitive recursive. So together, um, we now have to use certain facts about how terms and formulas are built. Uh, for example, unique readability that then can let us um, uh, recognize girdle numbers of terms and formulas and so on. Um, so you should verify this um, to some extent, uh, at least for, let's say, the, the set of terms till you see how this works. And then um, maybe also uh, think a little bit about formulas and sentences. Finally, um, this holds not only for these three sets, but it holds also for related uh, basic syntactical notions, something like uh, the number of free variables and so on. We would also like to be able to recognize the logical axioms uh, for over language. Um, and if we go back and revisit our logical axioms, we'll see it, it's not really a problem for the equality and quantifier axioms, since these are defined purely syntactically, right? So there's a, uh, a syntactic recipe, how we can form these axioms, given the formula, given um, uh, uh, variables and so on. So if we have a formula and we have variables, then for instance, this is a, um, so-and-so is an equality axiom. And since we can recognize formulas, we can therefore also recognize equality and quantify axioms. The case is a little bit different when it comes to tautologies, because tautologies are not defined directly syntactically, um, but rather semantically. Um, and there we have to work a little bit. So how would one proceed now to show that the set of propositional tautologies, right, um, in um, first order logic uh, is primitive recursive. So the first step would be to make sure that we can effectively recognize um, the set of propositional formulas. So then we would have, of course, start to encode um, propositional syntax, which is can happen exactly the same way as um, uh, for uh, first order syntax. So we can, and then following the previous recipe, we can uh, show that this is primitive recursive. In the second step, we then show that if we have a propositional formula, F with propositional variables P1 up to Pn, and a truth assignment to those variables, we can primitive recursively compute the truth value um, of this uh, formula under this assignment. So this works um, again through decoding a lot. So first we would get as an input a pair. We check if the first component codes a formula if, and if the second component con uh, codes a binary string representing this true false function assignment. So once we have that, we can easily conclude that the set of propositional tautologies, so pro tautologies of the propositional calculus, the girdle numbers of those formulas um, is primitive recursive. And then we have to still verify that the function that is defined by 
taking a sequence, the girdle number of a sequence of girdle numbers of formulas phi 1 up to phi n, and the girdle number of a propositional formula with uh, n uh, variables, that mapping this to the girdle number of the uh, first order formula where we uh, substitute phi i for pi, that this function here is primitive recursive. So once we have um, verified all those steps here, we get this result um, because every uh, propositional uh, or every tautology of first order logic is um, originates from a propositional tautology f by means of a substitution process like this. And summing up now, we have the following theorem. The set of x of all girdle numbers of uh, logical axioms over the language LR, arithmetic, is primitive recursive. And again, we can replace uh, language of arithmetic now here by any um, other finite language and uh, uh, adjusting our code, initial coding scheme accordingly. So now we have kind of finished the arithmetization process for all basic syntactical notions, uh, including the axioms. Um, and now we can uh, go on and look at things like uh, uh, complexity of being a proof, encoding proofs, uh, checking proofs, finding proofs, and so on. Since all of these now can be uh, encoded by uh, girdle numbers, we can now um, transfer the process or interpret the process of finding a proof as a process of finding a certain natural number. That means we can see whether it is, for example, uh, recursively enumerable or um, uh, even recursive and so on. So that's what we'll do in the next lecture.